I feel very called to become a member of the Catholic Church. Love the Catholic Church. It's just the best place to be. From the studios of EWTN, this is Open Line. In North America, call toll-free 1-800-585-9396. That's 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. You can also send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Thursday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for taking a little time out of your Thursday afternoon to join us on EWTN's Open Line. Father Larry Richards is in the house. We're talking the new evangelization as we do every Thursday. To be on the program, the toll-free number is 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America. one 800 585 Nine three nine six. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five, and we'll put you straight to the front of the line at one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five. You can send us an email, open line at ewtn dot com, or you can text your message to Father Larry. Text the letters ewtn to five five zero zero zero. Wait for a response. Enter your first name and your question data and message rates may apply. I'm coming to you live from the studios of Iowa Catholic Radio in my old stomping grounds, Des Moines, Iowa, where the wind speed is higher than the temperature. That's never a good thing. I assure you that's never a good thing. I'm sure you experience that in Erie, Pennsylvania once in a while, Father. It's, we're supposed to get 12 inches this weekend. It already started. Uh, well, let's hope that holds off here until I can <laughs> get out of town. The lovely and talented Elena Rodriguez produces the program. Your call screener is Mr. Matt Gabensky. As I mentioned, your host today, as he is every Thursday, the pastor of St. Joseph Bread of Life Parish in Erie, Pennsylvania, Father Larry Richards. Father, how are you other than preparing for a snow dumping? Who, who shovels your driveway, Father Larry? Yeah, no, no. We have people that do that by God's grace. Your people, your people. My people do that stuff, you know. That's what happens when you become a pastor. You have people. <laughs> you know, how do you so. How do you not have those people do your cut your grass? Yeah, I know. Well, out at my house, I do that, you know. But at the rectory, then of course, we have great people that do that stuff. Okay. You know, because it's a holy day, remember. So people have there to is. come to mass <laughs> so they can get here. For How many the masses mass. at St. Joseph's last night and today? We have one last night at four fifteen, and we have one, two, three, four today. We how many? One more how many families in the parish tonight. there? We have about 800 families. So everybody should be uh, served well by, yeah, by says, those there's masses. There's no reason to miss Mass here. We have it from 7 in the morning and 7 at night, 5.15 in the afternoon. So 12.10 for people at uh, lunch, and we have 11.30 in the morning. So we have all kinds of times there for lunch and Mass. And so as long as they get to Mass. So if you're thinking, oh, did I get to Mass today? You better get to Mass. It's a holy day. <laughs> so, you know, Father Larry, you could make a case. Yes that the new evangelization started when Mary was immaculately conceived in the womb of St. Anne. Yes. Which would make this a particularly poignant day to have Father Larry talking the new evangelization on EWTN's open line. Well, the the, the whole thing about why Mary was uh, conceived is, again, Jesus, you know, the, the, the Protestants often say, well, how can Mary say in her Magnificat, you know, God who is my Savior— well, because God was her Savior, Jesus saved her the moment that his mother was conceived. Because why? It's an eternal now of God that before God, his death on the cross already happened. So he took that and he placed it at the moment of the conception of Mary. So why? So that her blood and her body would be pure. So Jesus, when he took on flesh, would not take on sinful flesh. He would take on holy flesh. So the reason that uh, God chose from all eternity it should be Mac immaculately conceived was for Jesus, her son. But then even that, she still had the free will to say yes to that. And that's what I've been talking about at all the masses today here, that we too have a vocation. 
We too were created before the world began for a particular thing. And we too were called to say yes, because when Mary said yes, all of salvation came into the world. She became an instrument of salvation. And so we too, not in the same way as Mary, but we too, and we say yes to God's will, and we say, let it be done to me, that we too uh, get to bring Christ into the world, and we become instruments of salvation. So she was protected from sin and never sinned her whole life from the moment she was conceived in the womb of her mother, St. Anne. You know, Father, I've heard you speak many times, and you speak very eloquently and very clearly regarding the whole subject of um, Sundays and holy days of obligation, Mm -hmm. Uh, that it not so much being for us as it is giving God what is due him. Talk a little bit about Sundays and holy days of obligation. Exactly. We come to come to come to give back to Almighty God. You know, again, often people say, I don't get anything out of it. And I always say, I really don't care what you get out of it. This is your uh, chance to give back to God. He gives to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There isn't a moment he's not thinking about you or loving you. And he asks us to come together on Sundays for Mass, to be a member of the family. And on Holy Days, the Church asks us to come together because celebrate particular uh, important events in our church history, you know, like Christmas and Easter and the Immaculate Conception and all these things to help us to know that these are important elements in our faith and that we need to come together and celebrate them. You know, now sometimes different dioceses have their have the holy days on different days. Some will move them to a Sunday. I don't know if you can do that with the with today's date. I'm not. I don't think so. But other dates you can uh, throughout the United States. You can move them to a Sunday. Um, but it's still the whole point is is that we come together because these are important days. And we need to celebrate these days as a family. Just getting started on an open line Thursday. If you've got a question about the new evangelization, the number is 1-800-585-9396. That's toll free anywhere in North America. one 800 585 9396 Open Line Thursday with Father Larry Richards. Welcome to EWTN's Catholic Almanac. It's December 8th, and today is the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Pope Pius IX declared that at the moment of her conception, Mary was preserved from the stain of original sin through the merits of her Son, Jesus our Savior. Also on this date in 1869, Pope Pius IX opened the first Vatican Council. It met for nine months and then was suspended because of the seizure of Rome by the troops of King Victor Emmanuel. From EWTN News Nightly in Washington, D.C., I'm Lauren Ashburn with an EWTN News Link. Michigan's presidential vote recount comes to an abrupt end. A federal judge is following a state court's decision to stop the count. Donald Trump won the state. Iraqi forces battle ISIS militants in Mosul after reclaiming parts of the city. Mosul is Iraq's second largest city and is the last major urban area controlled by ISIS. Pope Francis says he's praying for the victims of yesterday's 6.5 magnitude earthquake in Indonesia. On this Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the Holy Father expressed his condolences for the earthquake victims. More than 100 people died. And saying goodbye to the giraffe, an international conservation group says the animal is vulnerable to extinction because of declining populations. I'm Lauren Ashburn with your EWTN Newslink. Podcasts of Open Line are available within 24 hours of live broadcast. Go to EWTN.com and click on Multimedia. Watch Raymond Arroyo, Father Mitch Pacwa, Mother Angelica, the Daily Mass, and EWTN Nightly News anywhere in the world for free. Cut the cord. Visit EWTNapps.com and start streaming today. Howdy, folks. This is Jimmy Aiken from Catholic Answers Live. And Advent is the time where we're waiting for Jesus to come to us. It's right there in the name Advent. In Latin, venire means to come, and ad means to. So Advent is when we're waiting for Jesus to come to us. And that's what makes Advent so special. 
Johnette Benkovic. Did you know that I had been away from the Catholic faith for 10 years? I credit my grandmother's rosary for bringing me back home to our Holy Catholic Church. She had 13 grandchildren and prayed a rosary each day for each one of us. That's 13 rosaries a day. I know that it was Grandma's rosary that tilled the soil of my hardened heart to eventually bring me back to our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Women of Grace with Johnette Benkovic, Monday through Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is Archbishop Charles J. Shapu. This is Teresa Tamio, host of Catholic Connection. Hello, friends. This is Father Wade Menezes of the Fathers of Mercy for EWTN. A very blessed Advent and happy Advent from all of us here at the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1 800 585 9396. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Couple lines open for you. Grab one of those right now at 1 800 585 9396. Toll free anywhere in North America. 1 800 585 9396. Jack Williams here, t- coming to you live from the studios of Iowa Catholic Radio. A uh, big uh, 10 year anniversary party tonight as they flip the switch to Catholic programming on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. 10 years ago today. To the phones we go. Our leadoff hitter today, Dolly in Pensacola, Florida, listening to EWTN on Guadalupe Radio. Dolly, you're on with Father Larry. Hello, hey, Dolly. Hello. Hey, Father uh, Father Richard. Um, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Good but, job. Uh, <laughs> I'm aware that I've been gone for so long since yeah, you me know, too. 40, 40 years. Easy. Um, me but too. Father Richard, you just uh, were talking about Mary um, uh-huh. That she was, uh, I'm, re- I'm rephrasing what you said. She okay. was saved through mm-hmm. Jesus. It's death on the cross. Who is her savior, uh-huh. who is also her son, uh-huh. before or from the, at least the moment that she was conceived. I have recently been listening to, I, I listen to Catholic Radio. Okay. And was she actually, I mean, do we, I mean, does the Catholic Church. Can we say that Mary was actually saved before the before, in the sense that before creation, before Adam and Eve, because God knew what he was doing. He knew, God the Father knew he was sending God the Son, Mm -hmm. and that we needed to have a perfect vessel. So Mm -hmm. does it really go back, 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 back? Well, it's always in the mind of God. You know, God cre. You know, as uh, Saint Augustine would say, "Oh, happy fault, oh necessary sin of Adam." You know that somehow, even when God created us, He already foresaw. Not only foresaw, because God lives in this nowness of time. That the world is being created now. The world is ending now. Jesus is on the cross now. Jesus is resurrecting now. We're in heaven or hell now. Everything's now to God. So, you know, He's ever present to every moment. Everything is now. Now we go through time, and so that. But when, like, when we go to mass, we don't re-kill Jesus. We're actually there at Calvary. We're actually there at the resurrection. We're actually there at the uh, when Jesus says at the Last Supper. You know, again, because we say in another thing, how does God? How did Jesus say, "This is my body," when he had not yet died on the cross? Because in the God's eternal nowness, he had already died on the cross, had already resurrected. And so every time we go to Mass, all eternity folds into time, and time folds into eternity. So from the very beginning, God knew everything was going to happen, of course. Did you know how he, how he, you know predestined that and that? That's when you get a lot of theological debates. But of course, God knew it from the beginning, because God is ever-present to every moment. Well, I'm going to go with that. There you go. <laughs> God picked Jesus, picked his mother, even before. I love that. I'm there going go. with that. Go with that. <laughs> Is that okay, Father? Hey, as far as I know, but there might be some theologian that calls and says, Father Larry's full of it. Oh, huh? well, I'm an evangelist. <laughs> no, I'm not, not in my opinion. You're from Pennsylvania. <laughs> there you go. God bless you. I love you. Thank you oh, very, thank very you. much. God bless Bye. you. Next stop, Houston, Texas. Justin is in Houston listening to EWTN on Guadalupe Radio. Justin, you're on with Father Larry. Hello, hey, Justin. How you doing, Father? I'm blessed. What is up in Houston? 
Yeah, it's not really high, a little cold. <laughs> oh, what is it, 70? Oh, Shut up. <laughs> oh, it's not that cold to y'all, but Texans, we don't get that. We don't get the cold, cold weather. So we're not I know, to I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what's uh, up? My question was uh, about Advent. I wanted to explain to my children a little bit better um, okay. why we give alms and just in per- in wide perspective, just Advent in itself, how how would I explain it to them the way Advent they can is very every is very much like Lent. It's a time of preparation to prepare our hearts right. to receive Jesus more fully. Let Him be born into us again. But it's not like you know. Sometimes I call them Advent Nazis. And okay, Christmas isn't here yet. You know, I used to put when I was in seminary, I'd put a nativity set out, and the seminarians would come around and say, "You can't put Jesus in there. He wasn't born yet." And I go, "Oh, shut up! He was born two thousand years ago." You know, stop it. You know, but it's time for all of us. We prepare our hearts to receive Jesus more. And so the more that we, you know, uh, deny ourselves and take care of others, the more we empty ourselves so Christ can fill us more. So does that mean not more. to eat meat? And other things. No, like, well, I'm again, right. traditionally, like, sure, like, what you don't have to. Have, the church hasn't put that on us for Advent, but some of the Byzantine churches do do that. You know that some of the Byzantine churches have a great fast during Advent too. The Roman Church in the modern times, we haven't done that, even though every Friday is a time of. Uh, uh, some kind of penitence, you know, you can decide what that is, bread and water, giving up TV, giving up talking, you know, whatever it is. But again, it's always to empty ourselves to receive Jesus more. So it's always a, a not just a focus on self, but it's a focusing on Jesus coming into our hearts and we need to make way for him to get there and there's more room for him. And but the best way to do is that... Is to sit there and like fill a glass of water and say, listen, if I wanted to give you Pepsi and you have a glass of water, I can't give you any Pepsi because it's already full. The more you empty the glass, the more I can give you Pepsi is a good way to explain to a kid. So for Advent and Lent, we empty our glass of self so that God can fill us more with himself. Okay. Okie doke. Thank you. Thank you for calling, Justin. God bless you. That frees up a line for you at 1-800-585-9396. Toll free anywhere in North America talking the new evangelization with Father Larry Richards, 1-800-585-9396. We have a message from Chrissy who's watching on YouTube, Father Larry, in Canada. Nice. I got, into a discuss- I got into a discussion with a Christian Reformed friend about how the Catholic Church is changing and rules about divorce are changing. This is very frustrating. I'm also very confused by the actions or non-actions of our current Holy Father. How do we deal with explaining this to others lovingly? Well, again, there is no problem with what the Holy Father, even though some people think, if you read all his stuff, he's very explicit about marriage and divorce and all that stuff. Now, what some people have taken, have taken two footnotes out of his last thing on uh, on the joy of love, and they say this is, this is opening up to people to receive communion that are, do not have yet their marriage blessed. And all he does is he's trying to be pastoral. He hasn't changed the teaching. Like, again, from the very beginning, the church has dealt with things in different ways. Like, for in the beginning, when it goes to confession, you had to go to confession uh, you only once you were baptized, they didn't believe there was any conf- forgiveness of sins after baptism. That's why so many people in the early church waited until they were on their deathbed to go to confession. Then the church grew and it says, well, you can go to confession once in your lifetime. And this would be a public penance. So you had to go and you had to get in front of the whole church and tell the whole church your sins on a Sunday. And everybody go, oh, pshaw, pshaw. And then we knew it, we knew it like you committed adultery and then the penance would be given to you and be a public penance then you were no longer allowed in the catholic church you had to stand in the front of the church when people walked into the church you would ask them to pray for you because there you are in your hair shirt or whatever penance it is you're not allowed back in the community and you'd ask the people to pray for you that's where the penitential rite came in from the early church and then on easter vigil you'd be brought into the church and the bishop or the priest would come and lay hands on you and forgive you your sins and there would be a great party 
huh? And so, so that's the way. It's it slowly went from just baptism to once in a lifetime, and it had to be a public penance. And then the church, as it went on, especially with the Irish penitents, the the Irish preachers, they talked about individual confession. And then, because there was they were going through so many, they would give the. Uh, absolution first and then the penance later. So the, the whole thing was the church always had the power to forgive sins. How we have done that throughout the years has changed because of pastoral reasons. But it never goes against the teaching of the church that Christ came to die for our sins. Now when it comes to marriage, you know there's all kinds of things. that There's one man, one woman, and two get married and it's for death to us part. And as we all know that that is uh, uh, the ideal and that's what we need to be striving for but then we find out that that hasn't always worked huh? that there are people that uh, for whatever reasons that don't and so then the church developed the uh, it's not a catholic divorce but the annulment process now again when the annulment process came in there is up in arms that you can't do that and that that it's just catholic divorce and then pastorally they dealt with that about this is how we deal with the situation when jesus says until death do us part Well, the sacrament of marriage never came into being, is what we're saying. So then you can get married again. And again, if you're married outside the church, if two Catholics go and they get married by a JP, we consider that an invalid marriage. So you could do that 10 times and still get married in the church because none of those previous marriages were accounted in the eyes of the church. So it's a very complicated reality. And the Holy Father is again and again, even the be- it's a beautiful document on the joy of love. If you read the whole thing, but some people went and jumped at the two footnotes and destroyed the whole thing and says, everything is, those two footnotes are wrong. And he's going against the old Holy Fathers. And I don't buy it at all. And most of the Catholic bishops and cardinals throughout the world don't buy it either. That most two Two-thirds of them have supported this, and did it. you're always going to have people to go back and forth. But if you look at Pope Francis's full teaching, he's very, very clear. And Father Blair, so, yes. You mentioned the annulment process, and it probably should be noted that the annulment process doesn't change the situation, any situation. Sure. It merely identifies the truth of a given situation. Absolutely. It says that the marriage never took place, is what it does. A Catholic, no, no, I can't say a marriage never took place. A sacramental marriage never took place, is what it is. Because again, people take that to the nth degree and they say, well, I'm not going to get a divorce, I'm not going to get an annulment after the divorce and everything else because I don't want my kids to be considered illegitimate. That does not do that to your children. So again, it's the way pastorally the church has dealt with this reality. And throughout the centuries, you know, the Orthodox Church dealt with it another way, the Catholic Church dealt with this way, and we are Catholic, so we go by what the Catholic Church says. And again, but how we pastorally deal with people throughout the years is a different reality. And so I would always sit there and say, you stay close to the Holy Father because we are Catholics, and that's what Catholics do. And he will steer us in the right direction. we got to trust that. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. You can also text your question to Father Larry. Text the letters EWTN to 55000. Wait for a response. Text your question. Elena Rodriguez, the lovely and talented one, will get your text, and we will get that on the air to Father Larry. Again, text the letters EWTN to 55000. Next up is Peter in Odessa, Texas, listening to EWTN, also on Guadalupe Radio. Peter, you're on with Father Larry. Hello, Peter. Hello. How are you? uh, Very good, sir. Uh, What's up? I had a question. I've got Protestant friends that tell me uh, that communion is symbolic, not a Mm -hmm. part of salvation, and I, they kind of confused me on that. Can you help me there, please? Oh, easily. <laughs> Absolutely. All he has to do is read John 6. And John 6, it says, My flesh is real food, my blood is real drink. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life within you. When Jesus says, This is my body, this is my blood, if it wasn't his body and not his blood, then Jesus Christ is a liar. And we know he's not a liar. And so... 
Again, the early church dedicated themselves to four things. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, which was the mass, and to the prayers. First thing Jesus did after the resurrection in the Gospel of Luke is he, on the road to Emmaus, is he said mass. He broke open the scriptures, but it wasn't enough for them. So he said, stay with us. And the way Jesus stayed with them and still the way Jesus stays with us today is he sat down, he broke the bread, and they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And with that, he vanished from their sight to show that he is truly present at the breaking of the bread. The church has always believed this from day one. It was not doubted until much, much later. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. Open line Thursday with Father Larry Richards. Hi, this is Doug Heck. I'm EWTN's president and chief operating officer, also host of EWTN's Bookmark. This Advent, I look forward to Christmas coming. It's a wonderful time of the year for our entire EWTN family, but it's also a tough time for many people. Family issues and problems, and we pray together that we all stay strong in the faith and wait for the arrival of our Lord once again incarnate on Christmas. The Wisdom of Mother Angelica. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Massachusetts. And and what is it that you wanted to tell us? I called to ask for uh, repentance, for unforgiveness, and also for a uh, change of heart. I'm one of those people that do the good things, you know, visit the sick and do other good things, but yet my heart is hard. So I call to ask for God's mercy and a change of heart. Thank you, Jesus. And you and I also want to pray for that. And I, I ask the Lord at this moment to give you that deep repentance that comes from love. The repentance, it says, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm so sorry. For more information on Mother Angelica, visit Religious Catalog at EWTNRC.com. EWTN Radio Classics is our 24-7 teaching and devotionals channel, straight from the EWTN archives. Go classic with EWTN Radio Classics, online at EWTNRadio.net. Now available on the EWTN app. This is Archbishop Charles J. Shapu. This is Teresa Tamio, host of Catholic Connection. Hello, friends. This is Father Wade Menezes of the Fathers of Mercy for EWTN. A very blessed Advent and happy Advent from all of us here at the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Tomorrow on EWTN Radio's Open Line, Colin Donovan takes all your calls about the teachings of the Church. 3 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question or comment, call 1-800-585-9396. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Be sure to keep it right here as soon as we're finished on many of these EWTN-affiliated stations. Tim Staples is going to join Al Cresta on Cresta in the Afternoon, talking about the biblical defense of the Immaculate Conception, very timely on this Feast of Our Lady on December 8th. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. 1-800-585-9396. If you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five, and we'll put you straight to the front of the line at one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five. Or you can text us your question. Text the letters EWTN to five five zero zero zero. Wait for a response. Type your first name and your question. Message and data rates may apply. We have an anonymous viewer in Berkeley, Michigan, who says, Why can't Catholics scatter our ashes? I'm helping a friend understand our Catholic faith, and this friend is a Jehovah's Witness, and I didn't know how to explain this. 
conception, especially on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, because it shows how much God loves the body and that we don't hate the body as Catholics, that the body is the place where God dwells. That's why, you know, again, we are told that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Another word for temple is tabernacle, that we are the place where God dwells. We are not God we are the tabernacle of God. We are the place where he chooses to live. And so because God chose to live in us all the days of our life, that we have to treat the body with great respect, like we treat any kind of, you know, a chalice or tabernacle or anything else. We treat a piece of metal with respect. How much more do we treat the body? And that like a part of when Mary was perceived or con, uh, conceived without original sin, God was protecting her body. When Jesus Christ took on humanity, when humanity took on divinity, divinity took on humanity. That you know, it calls divinization of man, as Saint Maximus the uh, Maximilian the Confessor talked about. And so, with all these things, that God chooses to dwell in the body. So that's why the body needs to be treated with respect, even after the body has been cremated because it was the place where God chose to dwell in our lifetime. So to just take their ashes and throw them somewhere would be disrespectful, but we treat them with great dignity. And that's why, and Rome just came out with another um, a church, another document about this just in the last couple of months because I put it out to my parishioners saying how important it is that ashes, just like the body of a regular person, need to be buried or need to be put in a place like a mausoleum or something to show respect for this place where God chose to dwell inside of us. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. By the way, we have a, a, a text question from an anonymous texter who wants to know, they travel frequently and often meet strangers on airplanes. What is their obligation with regard to sharing their Catholic faith with strangers? Again, I think it's always depending on what the Holy Spirit leads you. Remember in the book of the Acts of the Apostles when uh, Philip says the Holy Spirit came to him and says, go up and talk to that eunuch. And so he went and talked to that eunuch and he brought that man to conversion. Sometimes we go and push ourselves and say, okay, I got to save every person I meet. Well, we got to do it by God's grace. And so that's why I've said again and again, one of the best things you can do to be an evangelist is you say a prayer to the Holy Spirit of surrender every morning, whether it's Cardinal Mercier's prayer, whether it's John, I mean, uh, uh, St. Augustine's prayer. There are so many of them. And you just say this prayer. I mean, the prayer I say every day from Cardinal Mercier is, O oh, Holy Spirit, beloved of my soul, I adore you. Enlighten me, guide me, strengthen me, console me. Tell me what I should do. Give me your orders. I promise to submit myself to all that you desire of me and to accept all that you permit to happen to me. Let me only know your will. So let's say you start saying that prayer or another prayer. Again, this is Cardinal Mercier. M-E-R-C-I-E-R, -E -E Cardinal Mercier. You can look it up in Google and you'll find it, his prayer to the Holy Spirit. And so if you say that prayer every day and you say, use me and make me available to when it's best to speak your word and bring other people to you, then the Holy Spirit will use you as an instrument of his. And so then he'll just make it like you're sitting next to somebody because I do a lot of flying. I do not preach to everybody at six next to me. I give them a few minutes to see if there's anything happening there, if they're open or anything else. A lot of times, they put their earphones on and they turn away from me and okay that's it i'm not going to sit there and say hey can i talk to you about jesus you know, i don't that might be what jack does on his way home from iowa but you yeah, think it's the best <laughs> thing to do is to ask the holy spirit and see where he leads you and he will next up is tom in jacksonville florida listening to ewtn radio in jacksonville tom you're on with father larry hello yeah. tom hi how are you father and i am blessed today uh, my I son, am. who's 34 years old, has a question. Okay. He, uh, he's currently in Hawaii, but he said to me, Dad, there was Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, only four people. Uh -huh. And then Cain killed Abel, and why did Cain ask God to put a mark on him to protect him from being killed by other people when there was only three of them? Well, again, by that time, I mean, there was, we have Seth, there's a whole mess of other, they had more than two children. Now, whether they, whether they had them uh, when Cain and Abel was there, that would be a, you know, uh, 
theological uh, prep, uh, trying to figure those things out. And you could look it up on either. I don't know if EWTN would deal with that. You think they would deal with that, Jack? I think they probably would. Yeah, there you go. EWTN.com, you could go and ask that. Or you can go to Catholic.com and ask that question. Because, again, to, to get into the whole uh, scriptural reality of what happened at them it specifically is beyond what I could tell you. Thank you. My uh, my parish priest, he said the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you know, if you call when Father Mitch is on, Father Mitch knows everything. So you call and ask Father Mitch; he would know it in a half a second. <laughs> okay, thank you, Father. Have thank a blessed you. day. God bless you. I'm sure Bye Father now. Mitch would know. One Father Mitch knows everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He'll take a swing at it, even if he maybe doesn't. Exactly. Know it. exactly. There you go. One eight hundred five eight five. 9396, toll free anywhere in North America, 1-800-585-9396. Again, if you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd love to hear from you. Your number is 1-205-271-2985, and we will put you straight to the front of the line. Bernie is next up. She's in St. Amant, Louisiana, listening on the Almighty's 690 Catholic Community Radio. Bernie, what's your question today for Father Larry? Hello, Thank Bernie. You for taking my call. Sure. The question I have, I just heard your explanation about cremation. Uh-huh. But yet, Catholics can have uh, be cre- cremated, but as long as you have a Catholic burial. Sure. So what, what's the difference? The difference is how you treat the body afterwards. So if you take and you you bury the ashes, that is respectful. If you just throw the ashes, that the church considers disrespectful. And again, there's a a document, I I wish I knew the, I I had it printed out, but I don't have it here because I didn't expect to answer that today. But there is a document that just came out on the teaching of why we respect the ashes and why they, because of these reasons, they cannot be just thrown anywhere or thrown out into the sea as so many want it to be. It has to be respectfully buried. And again, part of that is that you could go visit the ashes, if you will. Like we're going to put a colibarium next to our church here, and there's more and more churches that are doing that. So when people come to Mass on Sunday, that they can sit there and visit their family, if you will, that's kept there in a, in a way of a respectful way. They also talk about that when people sit there, like nowadays, people are actually taking the ashes and splitting them up and putting them into, uh, you know, these little pendants that people wear. Again, those things are not allowed. They need to be buried as respectful, just like we take care of the body. Now, again, you can argue anything you want about it, but the, the, the church came out and says, this is what we can and cannot do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for calling. Thanks, Bernie. Appreciate that phone call. That frees up a line for you at 1-800-585-9396. That's toll-free anywhere in North America. 1-800-585-9396. Again, if you're outside the United States and Canada, your number is 1-205-271-2985. If you wonder, ever wondered how you could help spread the word about EWTN Radio in your parish community, well, you can... Consider becoming a media missionary. Uh, EWTM will give you all the resources and training that you need to help spread the gospel from your very own parish. For more information, log on to EWTNmissionaries.com. That's EWTNmissionaries.com. We've got a text rather from Nathan in Wisconsin. He says, what does that church teach about psychedelic drugs being used spiritually and to meditate on the Word of God? (laughs) Now, that's from your past, Jack. I don't know. (laughs) Well, of course, you can't use anything, any kind of uh, thing to help you meditate. God will use your body as it is, you know, and so... uh, uh, to use any kind of psychic to, to alter your mind would not be allowed by the church for any reason when it comes to that kind of stuff. The only reason you can use drugs is for people who are sick or for people who have um, uh, psycho- psychiatric illnesses, then that would be help to fix them. But for meditation and that, of course not. That isn't part of what we would believe or teach or allow. Next stop, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Steve's in Scranton listening on JMG, JMJ rather, radio. Steve, you're on with Father Larry. 
Hello, Steve. Hi, Larry. Yes. Hey, I love your style. Uh, well, I really need some guidance. My What's daughter, up? for a long time now, she's raising a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old. Okay. Her husband off and on been involved with uh, drugs, alcohol, uh, not physical abuse, but control. He's just getting out now. He got okay. out on the 4th, and uh, I haven't heard from them. They're both baptized Catholics, but they follow this Assembly of God thing there. The pastor's willing to help, but how involved should I get with that? Call them. Uh, I'm about an hour away from them. Okay. And what do you want to do, support them? I, I, I don't understand the question. My question is, as a grandparent, mm -hmm. as she's my daughter, mm -hmm. I hate to see her go through this if he hasn't changed after his in a couple of months away in house, you know, in therapy, mm -hmm. drug and alcohol. I think that first of all, there's a couple things going on. I mean, that's what my father died of. He died of alcoholism, and no matter what, he still you're still related to people in their struggles, you know. And uh, but at the same time, like if your if your daughter is being abused in that, she doesn't have to stay in a situation. But you're saying that she was never physically abused. The kids weren't physically abused, right? It's just mentally. Is that what it is? And, ain't, and I'm not just saying. In, uh, control. Yeah, okay. just control. And I'm not just they're saying like... there's nothing wrong with. Uh, there, there's a lot wrong with uh, mental abuse. Of course there is. I'm not saying that at all. But again, someone doesn't have to stay in a place where they can be hurt you know you have to especially when it comes to children you have to protect your children you know but at the same time if the man has went away for help there is a, you know i've seen people change completely after getting help with the drugs and alcohol that there is great hope and if they can get involved in aa or a, a program like that that i've seen people that have been uh, sober now for 40 50 years and they were horrible horrible addicts before so there is hope and so we have to always uh, reach out for that and reach out for this hope that somehow the god of the universe uh, can bring healing to them so your first thing i would do for you is just to fast and to pray and to really do everything in your power spiritually being an hour away that the Lord would somehow bring healing to him and bring healing to that family you know but again though you want to support your daughter in any way you can whatever she needs the most you know and uh, again there is no way in a three-minute conversation with you to tell you what that is what she does need the most but if you if you ask the Lord the Lord's gonna help you because he loves her he loves the man who's going through all this struggles whatever it is so God loves all of you so how will you bring healing to the whole family the best thing you can do beginning with is praying and then asking her your daughter what does she want and what does she need and you'd help her do whatever is gonna help uh, in the family the best. I hope that helps. Okay, I know thank, that you, thank you for calling us. God bless thank you, you, Steve. Appreciate Bye. the phone call. Next stop, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Kate is in Grand Rapids listening to EWTN on Holy Family Radio. Kate, what's your question today for Father Larry? Hello, Kate. Hi, Father Larry. How are you? Fine, thank you. What's up? I'm, I'm calling to ask you about uh, a Catholic wedding. If a, okay. if a girl wants, if a girl wants to get married, uh -huh. in the Catholic Church, uh huh, and she's marrying a non-denominational Christian. Okay, and he's agreed. He's agreed to get married in the Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, do you agree that it doesn't have to be a mass, or it shouldn't be a mass? We're being told that the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops recommends that it's not a mass. Well, it, and that's true. Disavowed. Well, yes, and the reason is is because half the congregation normally would not be able to receive communion. So that's why the, the, uh, a lot of people, now I always give them the option because I make sure that I go out of my way to, see, my father was a Protestant and my mother was a Catholic. And so I've always tried to make sure that we make everybody feel welcome. So I just 
ask the people to come up for a blessing at that time. So, but again, it's it's less awkward if there isn't a mass because that way uh, uh, half the people there don't feel out of place because they can't go to communion. So that's the, that's the theology behind it. But it isn't forbidden to have the mass. You know, again, I always let it up to the couple if it's very important to the family and that. But it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pastoral thing about how do you deal with the people that cannot go to communion and how do you still make them feel welcome in a mass. You understand? Yes, but I, I, it feels like a dumbed down version of a Catholic wedding. Just get, when you are getting the well, but yeah, that's well, the, well, yes, but again, no, what we're doing is like, let's say that she was going to get married in her his church, and they made you do everything that his church said that has to be done, and you didn't want to do that, then you would be not so happy, huh? Well, how about maybe this is my pride getting into it, but uh, don't we have the fullness of the faith? We, we have do have the fullness of the faith, but your daughter gets to make that decision. I always tell parents to stay out of it. I always say when parents will call me, I say, this isn't your marriage. Well, I'm paying for it. Well, then stop paying for it, I say. This is your daughter's wedding. You let her decide what she wants. You do not okay. tell her because that's not a loving thing to do. You understand? Okay. That's just, the best I, thing. I, I felt like it was a chance to, to witness. Well, it is a chance to witness. The church is doing it. So if the church is doing it, then it's allowed. So don't tell the church this is the way you're going to do it. I don't think, and that's what people are doing constantly now, that I don't like the way you're doing things. Well, again, we're trying to help people decide. So if your daughter, if the church says that she can get married without a mask, then it can happen. And you don't have, you can't push that. I'm very strong on that. It's not your wedding. It's hers. Well, I respect your opinion, and that's why I call. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much for calling. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. You too. Back to Louisiana we go. Doc is in the great state of Louisiana listening to EWTN Radio. Doc, you're on with Father Larry. Hello, Father Larry. How are you today? I am blessed. What's up? Uh, my question is, if the Ten Commandments state that we should have no graven image, why are there so many? Well, because first of all, we're not an Old Testament church, huh? And when Jesus right. came, he set us free from the law. It used to be in the Old Testament, you weren't allowed to eat uh, pork either. You had to be, uh, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, Kosher. You know, yeah, you had to have kosher. There was all kinds of laws that there was there. And so things have changed. And it's not we still don't have craven images because we do not worship images. It's kind of like if you have your, a picture of your parents that you carry around in your wallet, you do not worship that picture. You honor your parents who that picture reminds you of and so too what we do with statues and again this was dealt with in the church or the iconoclasm and and they were going back and forth because people were you know protestants would come in and destroy churches because used to have no craven images and da 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 and they destroyed a lot of beautiful churches in and throughout europe because of that very thing but again when you go back and forth on the theology of why we've done this from the beginning that it's done for a reason to not worship any kind of statue but to bring us closer to the god who that represents but again if we worship any statue it would be idolatry and we don't do that you know like i always do at my weddings here and i always say you know they're going to take a rose over to the blessed mother now i'll listen do you think we worship statues and i'd say don't be stupid we don't worship I, the last thing i'm going to do is worship a statue the statue reminds me of a mother in heaven that loves me and this helps me to love her more. And so that's what it is. So again, if you take, you can take any kind of scripture and say, well, this said it there. Well, I think there's a lot of other things you should be doing too, because you can't pick and choose what you're going to do once you start doing that. 1-800-585-9396 is our toll-free number. That's the number Sandy used. She's in South Florida listening to EWTN. Sandy, what's your question today for Father Larry? Hi, Father Larry. Um, I have been dealing for several months with issues of anxiety and fear and some depression, and I've found that other people are feeling the same way. And one of, when I go, I, I'm a, a daily communicant. I pray the rosary and the Divine Mercy Chaplet and, and read the scripture. And what I'm wondering is, I feel like my trust in the Lord is so weak. Um, and I'm just wondering, what 
do you think that those of us who are going through this kind of issue can do to build our trust in Jesus? It's not so simple. It isn't so simple, but in other ways it is so simple that mm. what, uh, what, you know, is something like for me, the, what I do every day more than anything else is I see the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Mm. And when I get uh, filled with anxiety, and boy do I ever, then I just cry out to the reality, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Sometimes I made it say that a hundred times a day. Jesus, I trust in you. And when you say that prayer, the prayer brings forth the reality. And when the reality of that, um, that the God of the universe came and died for us and seemed to set us free, that I just have to remember that, that he has done everything for me so that I can, do, that I can, I can trust him. Mm-hmm. And God will take care of us from there. That's certainly but, my prayer every day. And there you when go. I, when I say, Jesus, I trust in you, sometimes I feel like a hypocrite, and I say, Lord, do <laughs> I really? And, and so that's why I said, well, let me see what Father Larry does. Well, again, that, that's when you say it all the time. more, because the, the devil loves to keep you focused on yourself. There you and, go. Uh, that's so you I just tell him to go to hell. You're allowed to tell the devil to go to hell. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Father. God bless you. God bless you, too. We've got a text from Steve. He wants to know, Father Larry, why do we as Catholics say rest in peace when referring to the dead? Again, because I just had three funerals this past week, and so we say, may the souls of the faithful departed rest in peace. That means finally that this drudgery of our time on earth, you know, it's called the church militant, where we fight and everything else. Finally, they don't have to fight anymore. Finally, they're on the other side. So we hopefully they rest in peace because heaven is the place we have peace for all eternity, and our rest is in the Lord for all eternity. And that's, a, you know, what a great thing to hope for and pray for for all people quickly we'll head to paul in theodore alabama listening to ewtn paul what's your question today for father larry uh the lady that was just asked, sorry the lady that was just asking about uh no graven images uh-huh or he talked about no graven images sure sure the, the idolatry that that was talking about in the old testament that was people that saw god literally present sure. in the statue the mm-hmm. way that we know that jesus is literally present physically in present in the eucharist sure Absolutely. Yeah. And, that, so, and again, yeah, and I, and I could have said that better. Thank you for pointing that out. Absolutely. You're correct. About the contrast, what we do allow is Absolutely. the, Go the ahead. symbols are just reminders, just symbols. Mm-hmm. We don't think God is in that crucifix the exactly. way that he is, is in the Eucharist, right? Exactly. 100% correct. So I was trying okay. to explain not so well. So thank you for clarifying that. Thank you for clarifying. Absolutely. God bless you. God bless you. you, Paul. Appreciate the phone call. We've got a text from Spring, Texas, and the texter asks, if God made all good things and hell is bad, then who created hell? Again, hell is the, the uh, absence of God, so it's not a creation in itself. You know, it's like evil. Evil is an absence of God. Now, uh, Paul the Sixth talks about the reality of Satan is real because what he's done was he was an angel that decided by free will to depart from God. So evil is the app. It isn't cre- it goes against the creation what it was created for. So God created it good, and when someone goes against that, then evil is brought into the world. Death was brought into the world. Hell was brought into the world by the rejecting of all the good that God gave us and created us for. Very well done, Father Larry. Thank you. Do you have any gallivanting in your immediate future? I don't know. I'm, I'm in town until the third week of January, and I'm quite happy. My parish I'm keeps sure me very you're busy. Excited. <laughs> Would you leave us with a blessing? Father God of love and mercy, we ask you to bless everyone who's listening to us now. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Larry Richards, producer Elena Rodriguez, and call screener Matt Kubensky, I'm Jack Williams, giving one more thank you to the good folks here at Iowa Catholic Radio. Tomorrow, Theology Roundtable with Colin Donovan and the gang. Until then, God bless.